You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coon hounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Hey everyone, welcome back to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. This is Trevor Wade. I'll be your host today, Coonhound Program Manager here, and I'm joined by Mr. Alan Gingrich, the Director of Hunting Ops. How's it going, Alan? Good, good. How are you today? Good, good. Every time it's been a been a couple of weeks since we did one, I always get nervous when we come back for some reason. Yeah, I know. These you mentioned the lights are getting closer and it's uh yeah, just we, we kid our media guys. These lights <laughs> creep in every time we do just one. Just calm getting closer down. Closer. It's gonna be just fine. It's gonna <laughs> yeah. be fine. Yeah, well, the reason that we haven't done it in a while is you've been on a good hunting trip, I see. Yeah, yeah. I finally made it up north. Had a great time. Spent about nine days up in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, hunting snowshoe hare, and that was a that was a good time. Went up, and it was snowing between Grayling and Gaylor, or the, the bridge there. It was snowing on the day we went up there, you know, a week and a half ago, and, like, cars in the ditch snowing. And then the rest of the week, it was just perfect weather up there. Yeah. Really, oh, we had a, such a great time. You Dogs guys, did good. Great you guys kind of keep progressing. I see you get you started out sleeping in a in a hammock or a chair by the fire, and now you, you guys should got this see my whole setup. You, you should see my my sleeping bag. I have it's a yeah it's a it's a Taj Mahal for sleeping bags. <laughs> Everybody's jealous of my sleeping arrangements I have up there. But no, we have this wall tent, and this year, last year, we had uh, the uh, propane for heat in there, and we didn't yep. dare run it too long. We wanted to come out of it alive, you know. But this year we've had a wood stove in there, and you talk about it—a big improvement now. Yeah, it was uh, luxury. After you've been cold a time or two, you don't yeah. want to be cold anymore, yeah. do you? <laughs> yeah. So you took Homer and Henry up there. How are they looking now? Ah, you know what? They were strong as ever this year. Yeah. They're I've I've uh, worked on them on handling. They're handling a lot better. I actually got them halfway tone broke now, so that's always handy up there. But no, all the dogs did really well up there. Seemed like, and uh, we just had some great times. It's always funny first night or two you know uh, you're trying to go to bed and you hear the dogs outside you know squirming and this and that yeah. you know but after about the second night you there's dead silence you hear dogs snoring <laughs> yeah so <laughs> dogs and it. handlers snoring i'm yeah, sure but some well, miles I, in yeah, those I weeks know about handlers but yeah dogs are snoring <laughs> probably handlers too yeah that's no we a pulled an rv camper up there as well this year and oh, we had a nice setup it's just a good time yeah, going to try to get back up there for the snowfalls maybe for yeah, a few days. Yeah, probably. Uh, all of my brothers are up there this year except for one. My youngest brother is working out in Wyoming, but uh, he's he's now back. And uh, I told him, I said, hey, don't worry. I'll go up there with you <laughs> again. <laughs> so, what's, uh, what's game numbers looking like? It seems you, like I've been treeing a ton of coons this year. It seems like there's a lot of coons this year. You know, the last couple of years I thought up there that it seemed like the game may have been down a little bit. But this year I really felt like uh, it seems like it's – better again good and you can kind of the only way i can really gauge that is kickers you know side kickers that yep. you're running a hair and then you have other kickers you know that they just kind of push out or whatever and we saw more of those this year again so seems like uh seems like it was a good year so yeah it's funny how mother nature's kind of cyclical bringing yeah yep everything back around but yep. uh hey today's gonna be kind of a fun episode for us because we're going to talk a lot about a lot about new rules and procedures that are going into effect in our 2023 rule book that we've been working on the past couple of weeks yeah we covered the last uh, kunhan episode we did we covered three of the rules that was what episode 22 22, 22 episode yeah. 22 yeah we talked about uh, implementing uh, thermal imaging devices into the rules and talked about removing warnings from uh, striking their own dog and uh, and uh, not striking your dog on on or before the third bar yeah so uh, be sure you go back to episode 22 towards the end of that episode and listen to some clarifications that we talk about in that episode yeah so here you're gonna we're gonna cover three more the the last three remaining rule changes so yeah perfect yeah and then we're going to talk about some procedural stuff that you may have or may not have heard about that are going to be changes for this year so it's going to be some good information so you want to stick through to the very end and make sure that you're all up to date because uh, 2023 is coming pretty quick so we're going to start out first uh with Another one of the rules that got changed this year at Autumn Oaks when we had the voting, this one passed six to one. And basically it's to change and combine the rules for dogs treeing but not declared treed to receive the same demerit regardless of how the tree scored. And uh, with this rule change, now dogs treeing but not declared treed are going to get their strike points minus. And in no situation are they going to get additional tree points to be assigned and minus also. Yeah, this one passed six to one. And I'm 
I'm not that surprised on this one that it did pass, but it it is the one of the more misapplied or misinterpreted rules, the one that we get a lot of questions on. And I remember it was also probably one for me, one of the hardest ones to remember how to score dogs that were there treeing before you arrived versus dogs that come in after you arrived. And this was definitely one of those. Yeah. And anybody who's been listening to the podcast since the very first episode, they probably heard us talk about the application of these rules a few times already. So uh, those those couple episodes that we did are kind of going to become irrelevant now with this new rule change, but we're going to get it hashed out right here real quick so you guys can know how to score this moving forward. Yeah, and, and the new rule uh, the new rule will make it easier, more simple than than the old one was. You know, before uh, a dog treeing but not declared treed when you arrive, you don't know how to score that dog until you score the tree. Right. And that's what used to confuse people, you know, to remember that, you know, hey, we got to score the tree first to know how to score this dog. They wanted to somehow put the pencil to it or score it before that. But now you're going to know how to score this dog, uh, any dog that is treeing but not declared treed when you arrive. That's right. It's going to be a lot simpler for judges and handlers to remember this one. Uh, not to say it's good or bad, but it's going to be way simpler for anybody judging yeah, the cast. Yeah, sure. So basically, as far as uh, the changes that are going to happen in the rule book to satisfy this rule change, uh, we're going to change rule 4D, which you can find under the strike minus section of the rule book. Uh, that rule, uh, let's see, it will now read, if dog declared treed, after three minutes has elapsed, no additional dogs can be declared treed at that particular tree. Dogs tree in but not declared treed when judge arrives receives minus strike points. Dogs shut out on strike will not receive, will receive no minus strike points. Uh, refer to rule 6F for champion division casts and off game. Yeah, so we need to break that down a little bit. So we're talking about dogs treeing but not declared treat again here when the judge arrives to receive minus strike points. And whatever that dog was struck in at, is the points that that dog will receive, right. whatever that was, be it first, second, third, or fourth, that dog will receive those minus points. And that's going to, uh, it doesn't matter how the tree is scored. Right. This is for dog treeing, but not declared tree. Yep. And that's the big difference. Like you said there, I uh, used to have to could go in, see what the, how the tree was scored, whether it's plus, minus, uh, off game, circled, to decide what you're doing with those strike points. Now, right off the bat, you know that if the dog's tree in but not clear tree, when you're the, when the judge gets to the tree, it, whether it's plus, minus, or circled, you're going to receive minus uh, strike points. That's Simple right. Simple as that. You know, so you mentioned the shutout. If a dog is shut out, shut out. So let's talk about what shut out is. Shut out is when a dog has been declared struck and treed before another dog is has opened. Right. So the dog that hadn't opened yet, that dog's considered to be shut out. So we're talking about a dog that's shut out there. Uh, for a dog that is shut out, he does not have any strike points. He or she does not have strike points to minus. So in the case of a dog that is shut out on strike, that is here treeing but not declared treed when we arrive, uh, it, it does, ha does not have any strike points to minus. Right. You know, so yeah, the, the rule would be to minus his strike points, but in the case of a shutout dog, he has no strike points to minus. Right. You don't, it, there is no, he's not going to get anything bad out of it, no negative points out of it. Right. Then the third and final one that you mentioned here is uh, champions or grands, uh, and that has to do with the off game being in the tree. So that off game still applies here, even if they are treeing after the judge arrives. Right. For, for champions, or champions or grands. It, it's tree before the judge arrives. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those dogs would stay. Would not be saved by this. Right. They would still be. You don't minus their strike points. They would still be scratched for champions or grands if there's off game in the tree. Exactly right. And it, just to just to cross all the bases for any possible judges out there, handlers out there talking about uh, the tree section of the rule book. If you refer to the tree minus right now in our 2020 rule book, you'll see that there's a little section in there about dogs treeing but not declared treed on a minus or slick tree taking next available. Uh, tree minus or 25 tree points and and getting that minus that will no longer be the case this is going to be minus and strike points only there will be no tree minus points uh applied and minus yeah you never award tree points for anything now right after this after this rule goes into effect there is no more of that there's no situation where you're going to award tree points right and and like you said we kind of jumped ahead to shut out and it just remember shut out takes precedence over 4d in that case, you're, you got your strike points with a line under them. If it's on the tree that you shut out on, you're still going to get those points deleted, uh, not going to be minus it. Shut out takes precedence over that. Yep. And just real quick, I think it's important to to remind people, we don't want to get this tree and not cleared treed mixed up with Rule 5B, which we've covered before, which covers dogs that come into the tree after. That's right. Yep, after. 
So that rule is unchanged. That rule does not change. 5B is under circle points. Now, the only thing that uh, the only time a dog's going to get penalized for coming in after the judge arrives is if there's a raccoon in the scored in the tree. That's right. And in that case, that dog that came in after will also get his strike points minus. Right. 5B applies to dogs that come in after. Yeah. Just remember, 5B is unchanged. We're talking about strictly dogs treated, but not declared treated when before the judge arrives. Yep. So, uh, moving on to the next one that changed, and this one here is a, a pretty simple one. Uh, we're going to be changing Rule 4B to read strike points will be minus if none of the declared struck dogs open within six minutes. And this is just simply changing eight minutes to six minutes. Yeah, that's as that's as simple as can be. There, there's not there's not a whole lot we can add there. Right. Just simply uh, eight minutes to to six minutes, you know, and and eight minutes is kind of a long time, I especially guess. Especially in hour hunts, we're seeing more yep. and more hour hunts, especially at local level events, doing double headers on the weekend to try to get the most out of their events. So makes makes yeah, sense there, you know. And I guess uh, you can debate that a lot, you know. Why was it eight minutes to begin with? That's it seems like a long time, you know, but. Uh, uh, you do have dogs, I guess, that don't open that much, you know, just open here periodically. But eight minutes is that's still a long time. I've always thought it was a long time. Uh, you know, it, you know, you have a couple different you have open trailers, dogs that open a lot more than others, you know. So for your average open trailer, that's still a long, long time, seems like. But so six minutes. Yeah. You know, we we a lot of times have discussions how we definitely don't want our set of rules to cater towards dogs who are blow out of the country type dogs that are kind of putting a hindrance on clubs across the country, on events, on guides, on judges, making it hard. On a lot of things, really. Yeah. And I think this is a situation when it's coupled with some of our other rules, like the the no leash lock rule and some other things that we have. Another one that's implemented next, really, uh, that in this situation, you have two less minutes to hear that dog that's out there out of the country struck. You may, may lead to mm -hmm. people tending to try to keep their dogs within hearing. So where you take less, less strike minus, you know, I yeah. think we're definitely not catering to the blowout dogs with the, with a change like this. Yeah, no, I don't think so either, but yeah, that's a, that's a easy one there, you know? So, uh, one thing I think we did want to talk about here is, uh, obviously our HTX events, which we haven't talked a lot about on this podcast and we're going to, we're going to discuss the HTX program, uh, fully here within the, the next couple of months. I'm sure uh, we have plans to do so. Uh, but HTX also has their own set of rules yeah. and tree times and 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 also uh, strike strike times, times and all that. And and it's important to note that nothing is changed, nothing has or or we don't plan to change anything for HTX rules. Those stay as is. Don't go by night hunt rules to run your HTX. Go to the HTX rules for those. Right. They have so their, their rules. tree times are still five minutes. You know that didn't change when our tree time went from five to three minutes and uh, their track time is still eight minutes so it's uh and that won't change here because we changed it in the night hunt rules right. htx rules remain the same yeah no changes have been made to those in the past right handful of years right. so those should be those are all and on you know that I'm, book, i forget so. the year we implemented that the htx but we've we still have the same set of rules we changed very very little if anything as far as the rules go for it so they've been working quite well yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah well, when you boil down to it, basically, the dog just needs to go in there and tree a cone and yeah. not make any scratchable offense mistakes. Yeah. But, okay. So, uh, and moving on to the, this is the last rule change we have. Remember, we, we covered three of them back in episode 22, so you want to go back and listen to those. These are the last three of the six rule changes that we're making for 2023 rule book. Um, and this one here is uh, an important one. Uh, rem we're removing the stipulation that you must hear a declared struck or treat dog open before recasting your dog from a scoring situation. And this change is going to be made uh, for, to Rule 11D, uh, probably one that uh, made a lot more sense back in the day uh, and is kind of outdated at this point. Uh, but real quick, before uh, you get into giving us any color, I'm just going to read what the change to the rule book looks like. And this is in Rule 11D when you look at recasting. Um that rule used to read that after being scored, the dog shall not be released until another dog struck in on track or on tree opens. And then it clarified that by saying, if no other dog is declared struck, scored dog may be released immediately after scoring tree. And so basically we're just taking out that first sentence now with this change. Rule 11D, the first sentence of that rule is going to now read, after being scored, scored dog may be released immediately. Simple as that. 
Yeah, so, and I would say the intent behind that rule to begin with was to kind of keep dogs together. Back in the old days, dogs did pack up together, and we don't, we were seeing less and less of that nowadays, you know, and, uh, but we still had this rule in that you can't turn a dog loose until another dog opens, and the idea was to, so this dog would go into that dog that was opening. Well, even with this rule, a lot of dogs today aren't, some of them will, you know, but a lot of dogs aren't even going that way. Yeah. Right. You know, so uh, the intent of that doesn't really work anymore for the most part anyways, you know, so, but yeah, now you can just turn loose immediately. It's almost the polar opposite. It seems like most of the casts that I go on nowadays, we'll take the, the world finals, for example, we pull Jenna off of a tree, we get over here, uh, Sleepy's treed, um, Hawks blew out of the country and you got uh, Whitey running a track. They're both directly in front of us. The guide wants us to kind of keep Jenna in pocket. So we... We walk towards them a little bit, get ready to recast Jenna, and what does she do? Yeah. She wheels around a, another five, 600 yards behind us and Goes trees the other way. the opposite complete way. opposite way from them. So and seems tree like, to coon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Dogs nowadays, they're just not, they hear another dog, they're more apt to get away from that dog than they are to, to pile in and join in on the on yeah. the party, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, But that makes sense. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's also important to note or inject right here, you know, you still want to hunt. You need to hunt uh, where the guide wants you to hunt or in the in the direction the guide wants you to hunt or try to at least, you know, so uh, uh, to try to keep the cast together and things of that nature, you know. But yeah. uh, the other thing that's going to probably uh, uh, that we probably should discuss along with this is you still, uh, you know, after you cut a dog loose, you might still, maybe there's no dog opening at this point now. You still need to run the six minutes is what it's going to be. Right need to run the six minutes so you still you can come out of a scoring situation flip your dog loose or what have you let it go and you start the six minutes but go to where you last heard the dog uh, before you start your six minutes you still need to do all that right and and we've saw discussion about that you say you flip this dog loose this dog's a half mile through the country over here that we're supposed to get to and run the six on um, we cut this dog loose it opens as a judge you have to make every attempt to split the difference between these dogs and try to get to a place where you can judge both both dogs accurately. Yeah, and, and there's another rule in the rule book I think I don't think we talk about enough anymore, especially these days, and we don't hear a whole lot about it, and that is that where judges do have the authority or the option to call timeout if they have dogs trailing out of uh, trailing out of hearing in opposite, opposite directions direction. or different directions right. to where you can't judge them anymore, you know, and, and handlers and judges should know that they do have that uh, option versus – Instead, opposed to just following one dog or the other, you know, you need to uh, try to stay, uh, separate, you know, uh, split the differences, so to speak. And and if they trail out of hearing in different directions, uh, it does say trail out of hearing. You know, you can't, that doesn't mean a dog that you know because your Garmin is a mile out that way and you're not going to hear it if it's opening. That's, you know, one that has never opened. That's not what the rule means. It's a dogs that are actually struck in. And, and trailing out of different directions, only then should you be able to uh, call timeout if needed. And and don't you think that this is another rule that kind of inadvertently has the effect to where dogs that are blowing out of pockets, it kind of favors your dog that's in pocket. It After does. you score this dog, you can go ahead and cut loose and you don't have to yeah. walk a half a mile to hear this dog that blew out of pocket. Exactly. It You're does. Almost, it kind of does. If your it dog, does. if we cut loose and yours blows a mile through there and mine's, you know, 350 yards right here and I get to cut loose again, mine's barking. It's yeah. going to be hard to, yeah. to hear your dog that blew out of the yeah. country there. And it's, you know, we, we, we talk about that and you, you, uh, nowadays even more so, you know, they want them deep and alone, you know, and that, I guess that works sometimes and especially yeah. maybe in an hour hunt, right. but it's still in the hour and a half and two hour hunts. If you have a dog that will uh, run the tracks they come to or as they come to and and run and tree those, those dogs are going to be hard. And have them, those dogs are still going to be hard to beat. Yeah, they are. Really hard. And this, you know, being able to turn them loose right away without having to wait. In our part of the country, up here in the northern part of the country, six minutes, or it used to be eight minutes, now are going to be six minutes. Uh, rather than hanging, keeping my dog on the lead, uh, I can tree a coon in six minutes. Right. Yeah, quite absolutely, easily. Sometimes. Absolutely, and we've talked. We talked about this when in, back in the rule proposal uh, episode about it when we were talking about uh, what these what implications these rules may have, and talking about the TOC final cast whenever Dominator was on the on the leash so far when we yep. were going to hear Piper, and you know that's probably more the intent of the rule. Yeah, but in this situation, a dog that's blew out like Piper, and you cut Dominator loose and Connor McGregor loose, yeah. you're never. I mean, Piper being out of the country, it's just kind of an inadvertent effect. You know, we we want to make sure that these dogs aren't leash locked for 20 minutes in the mm -hmm. middle of a major hunt like that. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of a, 
uh, they eight minutes. In that case it. that you're uh, talking about, that was a lot longer than eight minutes where oh, that yeah. dog had to be on the lead strap. Oh, yeah. We had to walk to where we last heard Piper mm-hmm. and then run eight minutes. Yeah, so it ended exactly. up being a lo- uh, quite a bit longer than that. Like uh, a good 10, 12 minutes or longer. Uh, before we get away from this one, though, it's important to note the option. Uh, yeah. Handlers will still be able to retain their option when they pull from a scoring situation. If there's any other dog in the cast declared treat, exactly, you still have the option to keep your dog on the leash, handling to the next uh, to the next uh, scoring the next tree to score. Yeah, and that's that uh, that option is only there for a handler to not turn his dog loose is if there's another dog declared treat. Yeah, so. If, yeah. if there's no dog declared tree, they have to turn loose. Right. Have to turn loose. Yeah. So I think I think those are three rules. You know, sometimes we don't know what's going to pass and what's not going to pass, but hearing different discussions about it and looking at the rules, I think these this isn't this is going to be good stuff. I believe. I think so. It end up being good. I think up, it'll be good. You know, the one other point we might make is how soon do they have to turn the dog loose? And you know, we don't have in UKC we do not have a time limit that you walk away from a scoring tree. Back in the older days. Uh, we, I, I was like that anyways. I train my dogs. I want to cut loose right from the tree right. as soon as I can step away from it. I'm turning loose. Now I know that doesn't work for everybody, you know, don't want their dogs to wheel around and go back on the same tree. But, um, you know, so the rule is that you walk a, a, a distance that is, uh, you know, comp- or, uh, a kind of deemed reasonable. Reasonable. Yeah, yeah. reasonable for everybody involved, yeah. you know, and, and, um, we hear more and more talk about, well, we need a time, we need a time. And, I don't know if we do or not, you know, uh, you know, that, uh, you can debate that all you want. And I know guys will, that will, you know, kind of use that to their advantage or disadvantage, what have you, you know, but, um, I think as a judge, a, a way that has always worked for me is if, if I'm judging and we walk away, I'll walk a, a certain distance. It might be, I don't know what that distance might be 30, 40 yards. And I'll stop and say, Trevor, are you good here? And you say, no, I'm not. I, I want to walk a little further. I might go another 30 or 40 dog or 30 or 40 yards and say, all right, guys, flip them. Yeah. And usually don't even give you the opportunity to ask you again. Right. Say, now we're turning loose. And I've just never had any issues with, with that. I think it's just kind of more or less a judge kind of taking charge and, and keeping things within reason. Yeah. Yeah. And anytime you give somebody a little bit of slack, yep. they're going to see how much you exactly. get away with. So. Exactly. Yeah. So that's good. Uh, so we'll take a little break here, and then we're going to get back and talk about some of the, the other changes that we're going to have as far as procedural rules go for 2023 yearbook, or rule book. sorry. This podcast is brought to you by the all-new Dogtra Pathfinder 2. Dogtra, the official GPS collar partner of UKC. All right, so we've we've highlighted a lot of the rule changes that are going into effect for 2023, but we do have a handful of procedural changes that are going into effect in 2023 as well. So I figured we'd give them a little bit of of talking here before we uh, move on to other things. But uh, the first thing is going to be hunt directors. Uh, we've talked about hunt directors a lot the past few years since I've been here at least, and probably well before I got here. And uh, in the new 2023 rule book, you're going to find that hunt directors are now eligible to compete in events that they're officiating. Yeah, you know, hunt directors, we, we, I don't know when we implemented or allowed the use of hunt directors. You used to always have to have a master hounds, you know, so I'm going to say hunt directors have been in since, what, 2012, 13, 14, somewhere in that time period when we allowed the use of hunt directors. But that hunt director still fell under the same criteria as a master hounds when it came to them needing to stay at the clubhouse and couldn't go out and handle a dog or guide or judge or anything like that, you know. Yeah. And and really, um, this we're going to loosen up on that. They were they will be able to guide or judge and you know or handle a dog. Right. Their dog could actually be entered in the hunt, handled Always by somebody could. else. Right. But the the individual had to stay at the clubhouse. Uh, so uh, you and I know what was happening. We'd get you know names we've never heard of on the event reports, and there's a problem with the event report. You know, we call this person. And uh, things, it doesn't oftentimes doesn't take long to figure out, well, they know very little about what's going on here. Yeah. So what was basically what was probably happening and, and probably the good hunt directors are, some of them are doing the draw, you know, and then they turn it over. Some of them are just have, simply having somebody sign the paperwork. Right. And that wasn't the intent of it. Right. But so I think this is going to be good. I think it's going to help clubs. Uh, to where they're using their best people to serve as the hunt director, do the draws, do them right, you know, make sure everything's done correctly. Uh, you know, all the 
cast winners, uh, put down the, the event reports filled out correctly and get your best people to do that or capable people to do that. You know? Yeah. And, and we've talked about it a little bit on here and you hear it everywhere. And unfortunately clubs don't have the participation that they've always had yeah. um, to have extra people sitting around to do this and that. So now you have a member of the club, you're an officer of the club, you have a dog that you want to campaign, but you don't have somebody to do the hunt director. Now you can do both. And that's just going to help clubs. Like you said, in any way we can help clubs, we're going to, Always try to do it if, if it's reasonable and something that we think is going to uh, help but not uh, hurt somewhere else. We're not going to borrow from here to hurt here and, and yeah. that sort of thing. And I think that uh, this comes with a lot of thought. You know, we've talked about it. We've had conversations about this for three years now, yeah. just you and I, and I've yeah. had conversations with other people. And we know that other registries do it this way. But, of course, when other registries are doing it, that doesn't mean that we have firsthand knowledge of, you know, how how good is this working? You know, what issues are arising? But in 2022, you implemented this in the Hunting Beagle program where hunt directors were able to compete in the event. And then that way, for the Coonhound program, I'm able to see what you're doing this year, what problems you're having uh, before we throw it into the Coonhound program. And you've actually, I've not heard of very many problems that you've had at all this year. Yeah, that's a lot smaller scale, you know, but uh, really, and those guys don't have much, many issues to begin with anyways, but it has worked well. And we've not had any issues come out of it, you know. The biggest thing would be for if a cast has a question that comes back, uh, first of all, if there is a question on in the cast, uh, needs the hunt needs, they need to finish their hunt first before they bring a question back. That's right. The only exception to that ever is, is if there's a dog, if it involves a dog being scratched out of the hunt or something like that, and there's a question on that or if it comes to that. Uh, so any questions can be resolved after the hunt is over. So... That's one thing, you know, that's what the Master Hounds does. If the Master Hounds is there, he rules on the question. But in the case of a hunt director, it goes to a panel. Now, the hunt director is the one responsible if there's a question comes in to get a panel put together. And he or she may sit on the panel if they're qualified as a panel member. You know, don't have any uh, stake, you know, with the with the right. person or dog or that, uh, that has a question or, or are knowledgeable of the rules, yada, yada. Um, but this can happen after your hunt is over with. You know, so worst case scenario, the the hunt director is out hunting or guiding or judging or something, you know, uh, and they are the last cast in. That's still fine, you know. Now, the, another thing that a hunt director does is uh, when the scorecards come back, first thing, very first thing they should always do is note the time that they receive the scorecard and write it on the scorecard before you do anything. That should always be number one. Right. So there's going to be uh, cases where there's going to be scorecards coming in before the hunt director comes back, you know, so I don't think we have to have, it's not rocket science, you know, uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. The, the club can assign somebody to hang on to the, to the scorecards or maybe just designate somebody. I don't think we should have any issue, take any issue with a club designating somebody. Hey, if, if you're back before I am, you know, you're, you take the cards until I get back or whatever. Right. I don't think anybody should uh, make any issue of that. Note the time and just, uh, and, and the other thing is, um, uh, is, uh, is put the scorecards up somewhere, just yeah. keep them somewhere where not everybody's digging into them and this and that, you know? Uh, so I think if the club works together with their officers a little bit, all that shouldn't be any issue. We can make issue of it. If we, I guess if we want to or do, but I think we can work around some of those things well, I think easily the, enough. The important thing that I take from what you're saying there is that uh, local level events and local clubs are the lifeblood of, of the registry. Um, it's where the, st that's where the beginners start at out. That's where people are getting a, a you know, a bulk of their wins through the year. Um, and it gives you a chance to go and compete with your dog on a smaller level with, with your buddies and stuff. And it's important that we do everything we can, not just us as UKC, but the people out there holding each other accountable, using uh, you know their best common sense to make sure that things are run smoothly. Yeah, and, and to working together to make sure you have a quality event. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, oftentimes I think the club's best officers or members that are involved, in, like as being serving as a hunt director, uh, they they often tend to be some of their they need them as guides. Sure, they're also some of their best better judges sometimes. You know, so just to take them away from not giving you know, say, well, you can't be the hunt director then, or you can't be involved because you're hunting or guiding or, or, or judging or what have you. I think this just makes it better for everybody. And, and not just that also, these guys are the ones that need to be teaching and that's their right. other members. That's a good point. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, and a couple of things that you already talked about that I have, I have bullet pointed here to, to just mention real quick 
is that this is going to ensure that knowledgeable people are filling out event reports, making sure that they get it right as far as numbers of entries and how it breaks down and filling out event reports right so we don't have issues on the back end where people are waiting on wins or held up because we're having to send information back and forth to get the reports filled out correctly. Yeah, so we talk about uh, reports that aren't filled out correctly. And let, let's just give a little example. I think one of the biggest ones, since we have double headers, uh, officer uh, hunt directors that don't really know how to fill them out, if they have a double header, one thing that a mistake that we see a lot of times is they'll take the one same report and use it for both hunt number one, the early hunt and the late hunt, put everything on the same report. Yeah. That's not the way that's Hunt number one should have its own report. The number of dogs that were entered in it should be noted on it. Yep. And then hunt number two should be a brand new or a, 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 another clean sheet or a new sheet for or a form for hunt number two. It's two separate hunts. Two, two separate, separate hunts. reports. Yep. And the, and the number of dogs on that one, instead of taking the hunts from both from uh, numbers from both events and com trying to combine them, that will that will stop up. We can't process a report like that. And and just real quick, I actually filled out a call from a gentleman yesterday who who's uh, he's a club president. He doesn't he's he's older in age. He doesn't compete in the events anymore. He was uh, serving as hunt director at a lot of their hunts, and he's he's hearing rumblings that hunt directors are now allowed to hunt. Well, I I don't hunt anymore, but I could be a non hunting guide or a non hunting judge if need be. And like you said earlier, uh, that's that's uh, permissible as well. You'll be able to go out and. Uh, Compete in the event or also guide or judge where need, where need be if, mm -hmm. if necessary. And I think there's going to be a lot of clubs that are going to appreciate us opening this up for their hunt director to be, uh, to do, to be unlimited basically in what they can do. I think uh, one thing that, that kind of came up here recently that we talked about a little bit that we should probably shed some light on is that uh, in this format, we need to cut down on some of the petty questions that are coming back. You know, uh, obviously, if you have a legitimate question, it needs to be heard and the call needs to be right. But if if you're uh, just grasping at straws for a hunt and you have a question that you know uh, isn't legitimate and you're bringing it back, for that reason, uh, it, and especially in the hunt director format where you're bypassing the master hounds and you're going straight to a panel, we're up in the, the panel fee from $10 to $20 in this new rule book. Yeah, when we implemented the hunt director, we did, uh, that's when we implemented the fee for that goes directly to the panel. You know, the question goes directly to a panel. And it has nothing to do, the fee has nothing to do with money, really. It is just to, hey, before you before you just bring any question in, you know, uh, make sure it's a legitimate question. We're going to get in your pocket a little bit, you know, 10 bucks. Well, these days, that's not a whole lot. And just upping it will just, I think, will keep that, uh, keep that within reason. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, so the first step is if you have a question, the procedures follow the question or follow the procedures that are on the back of your scorecard to resolve something in the field. If you can't, you ask for a question mark to be put on the scorecard and comes back to the panel. Master Hounds, unless you use a hunt director format, then it goes to a panel. And so anytime it goes to a panel is when this $20 fee is going to be associated. So if you don't agree with the panel's decision, there's still another avenue, and that is an appeal. All this is in the rule book and also on the back of the scorecard. But you, if you don't agree with the panel's decision, you do have the option to appeal to UKC. And then there's also a fee for that, and that's also 20 bucks. But the interesting thing with that, we didn't used to have an appeal fee but back in my day, you and I were talking about this a little bit this morning. I asked, you know, you've been here, what, two, three years that you've been dealing with uh, right. with anything like that? I asked you how many appeals you've had. You've had, what, two or three, if that? Yeah, I had zero. Zero, okay. Zero appeals so far, yeah. Well, back in the day before we had any of the, the $20 fees on appeals, an appeal coming in on a weekly basis was very common. Yeah. You know, I kept uh, all of my appeals in a, in a file. And that file in a year was, you know, this thick <laughs> yeah. of appeals that we ruled on that came up here. And that's just, it's kind of amazing how that $20 has kind of and how many stopped of them, all that. How many of them were really simple. And, and you know what? It's, yeah. it's not, it, appeals are about getting it right. Right. And, and oftentimes uh, after we did that, it seemed like to me, if we did get an appeal, generally they were right, you know, right. and they knew they were right. And, you know, the, they're going to get that money back. So it's not about the money. It, it's just about, I have a legitimate question, right. you know, and not just grabbing for straws. Yep. Yep. Simple as that. So it's, it's really worked, but we're not trying to discourage uh, it, them 
uh, exercising those options if they need to. Absolutely, they should. We'd encourage them if if they if they are in fact right, so we can get it right. Yeah. But uh, let's make sure we have a legitimate question. Yeah. Hey, and, and in case you you don't know or you're unfamiliar with the rule book, be sure to read about the panels. But if you put up twenty bucks to get a panel to hear your question and they rule in, in favor of you because you're correct about it, then you get your money back. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So talking about one of our next changes, and this is one that uh, uh, will have an effect on quite a few clubs that are now going to slam events, is that now in all slam events, hounds are going to be drawn out together regardless of their title. That's going to start in 2023. That's right. Not separating them into red that's shirt and champion the way, That's the way anymore. it used to be. Slams were like that forever. And uh, from, their, uh, from the day that we started them, and we changed it uh, to for performance points purposes because any any categories where they all drew out together, uh, we didn't award performance points. And it's this is just when you need to go back to putting them together. It just makes a whole lot more sense to put them back together. Well, you talk about, okay, they're not going to get performance points now, but let's talk about the the pros of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a payout event, and if you have uh, kind of an odd number of registered yep. champion dogs, you're creating an extra cast. Yep. Which is reaching into your pocket on the break on the yeah. breakdowns of cast winners, yep. and it's also and it did happen yeah. a lot. Sometimes yeah, you had you maybe five registered dogs and five night champions, so that was a three dog cast and a two dog cast. You know, twice that. You know, two of them like that in the uh, registered division and two in the champion division. And and you're right, yeah, it's not uncommon at all. And then no. in that case, you got a two dog cast, and you're getting paid this. You know, uh, it, there's some different things in it. There's yeah. opportunities where you have a two dog cast over here and a four dog cast over here. And it's just some different things that happen. Yeah. Like that. And how but, long we've had this for what, I think six years, the last two rule changes now that we yeah. changed this to, and we still have some, Hey, when did this change? Yeah, we we're still putting all the dogs together. They're still close. Now we're going like to flip that. it back again. Sure. Now we're going to flip it back again. <laughs> Half of them will still be right. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, we we've heard from clubs about this isn't isn't something that we just did on a whim. We're hearing from clubs that hold slams primarily, yeah, and they want to see this because it's going to save them a guide or a judge here yeah. or there. And yep. It's going to make it easier on them. Several and pros. Yeah. A couple of these things are we're just trying to make it easier on local clubs at the local level. Yeah, yep. So I think that's going to be a good thing. That'll start in January, January one, twenty twenty three. That's right. All dogs will draw together again at slam events, regardless of category. All right, so we're shifting on to uh, our next uh, kind of procedural change, and that this is this is nothing big, but I think it's a good uh, time to talk about the implied scratch rule. Um, it's kind of got some buzz here in the past year uh, from some some uh, different rules popping up, and I think this is a good place to talk about it. But we felt that it was important to put the definition in the rule book. It's not in there currently. Talked about in the uh, in the advisor column a few different times over the past twenty years. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now it's going to be in the rule book, adding it to Section 6, where it's going to talk about the implied scratch as a scratching offense. Yeah, and that's something Todd Kellum wrote about years and years ago, you know, about the implied scratch. And uh, and we've re uh, ran that uh, article over and over again throughout the years or whatever. But, uh, yeah, the you know, the question is, first question is, what is an implied scratch? Right. Yeah, and and basically you can sum, it's a great article by Todd, and if you haven't read it, it's I, I've uh, posted it recently, you did before I did. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a good one to go back and read, but basically you can sum it up in one sentence that he put there in his first paragraph. And basically it's uh, scratching a handler or a dog for doing something that the rules specifically say you can't do. Yeah. Or you can look at it on the other hand, in some cases for the handler not doing something that the rules specifically say you do, you should do. Yeah. So yeah. It, one of those two, when the rule book tells you to or not to do something, you should yeah. follow the rules. And if it doesn't have a consequence there associated with it, then that consequence is the it's, dog or the handler being scratched. Yeah, the that that is what an implied scratch is. You know, if the rule says, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen. You're going to get minus, or you're going to get scratched, or you're going to get a warning. When it doesn't say you're going to get minus scratch or get a warning, it, then it becomes an implied scratch. You know, so uh, there's there's going to be uh, the discussion is or the debate is going to be. Some will say, well, uh, you should just put anything in that you can be scratched for. It should be, anything you can get scratched for should be under Rule Six under the scratch rule. Well, I'm here to tell you, we can sit down and we can start making notes of all this and, and we'll forget a whole lot of them, yeah. but it would be unreasonable and impossible. Yeah. The things that come up or can come up, you could just never, never uh, cover everything. Right. Not even close. Yeah. You know, so that's just, uh, you know, to have an implied, you know, rule it works much better. And I, I just quickly jotted down just a couple examples just for so you guys know what I'm talking about. This yeah. obviously isn't Perfect. all of them in the rule book, but... Uh, the rule book says that the judge should be the first one to arrive to the tree. So if I'm a handler and I'm way out in front of the judge going there and handle my dog, 
I'm scratched. The rule book tells me not to do that. Simple yeah. enough. Rule 9D, it says that. Yeah. Uh, for failure to lease your dogs at the tree. And 11B, it tells you to lease your dog upon arrival at the tree. Uh, shine in the tree during the two minutes the handler that first they had first tree wished to shine alone. So you get first tree on the tree. You want the first two. You're red lighting it, and I throw my high beam on there. Rule book tells me that you get the first two minutes. I'm going for it's just simple things like that that the rule book doesn't tell you that you're going to be scratched for doing those things. It just tells you not to do it, and if you do it, you're yeah. scratched. And those are also some things that you want to be reasonable about. You know, maybe the judge. You know, if I'm judging, I'm probably going to if I see a, if I see you running ahead of me to a tree, I'm going to say, "Hey, Trevor, hold yeah. loose here, hang loose, yeah, back off here." You know, I got to be the first one at the tree. I'm not just going to wait till you let you run up there and say, "Oh, surprise! We're going to get you out of the cast." Yeah. You know, and you hear some stories like that, you know, but that's not the way judges should handle it. You know, should first do your due diligence. If you're going to not uh, uh, heed to to me, to my instructions, uh, you know, and back off or get get back here with the cast, then I won't have any choice. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, just— uh, and, sa and same thing with somebody throwing a light in the tree. That just goes with, with good judging, I think. You know, you, you mentioned that as an example, and it's a good one to use it as an example. I need to give you the first two minutes, but if—, if uh, uh, Todd Killam starts throwing his light up there and say, hey, Todd, he, he, Trevor wants the first two minutes. Yeah. And then from there, if he says, well, I don't care if he does or not, I'm going to keep shining. Well, okay, then. We're gonna... <laughs> you shine back to the yeah, truck. Yeah, <laughs> you shine your way back to the truck. Right over there it is, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I but, think this is just, man, just adding the definition there. Just be a sportsman is all it is. So it's it's real there's, simple. There's really, if you really start thinking about it, there's a there's way, way too many things like that to be adding, having a list in under Rule 6. Right. And and like you said, you're going to miss some things when you put it in Rule 6. And uh, then what absolutely. people are going to get away with uh, doing things that they should, they're not yeah. supposed to be doing. And yeah. yeah. Just because of a technicality. So adding right. that in there, yeah. that's the right move. Yeah. So, yeah, what you're going to do here with this, you're going to have a section in there. You're going to write, uh, have a, uh, what an implied scratch is. That is not there right now. Right. Just add it into rule six. Yep. Uh, all right. This, this is one that's not so much a procedural change that we're going to see in the rule book, but I thought it would be good to talk about it here a little bit. And that is uh, the decision was made that instead of every three years having a rule change year, going to change it to five years now. Um, I think this really came up this year. Uh, we have what we feel like is a very strong set of rules. And I don't know. It just doesn't seem like every three years we need to be altering these things anymore. I think they're about good where they are. And uh, we discussed it with the breed associations. And it all seemed really positive when we were discussing that. So I think we're going to move forward with that. Yeah. And, you know, there's some other little things that we can kind of use sometimes through our Master Hounds checklist. And the checklist is what the official, the Master Hounds or the hunt director it is mandatory for them to read off before they call out casts at every event. Um, and that checklist also gives us an opportunity to put in some, some notable things, you know, or, or, you know, important reminders and this and that, you know, so that's an avenue for us to use to, uh, if there, if there is anything, you know, that might change slightly or policy change or something like that, you know, so that's a, one thing that we have there that the one thing you won't have in the rule book, uh, is telemetry rules. That's right. And that's kind of by design a little bit. And those are actually on the back of the uh, Master Hounds checklist for them to to just post at the clubhouse. So that's a good example of something that we could change midstream that we may want to or need to. Uh, you know, that doesn't require, so we wouldn't have to wait uh, every three or five years to change it in the rule book uh, yeah. but, and do it through that avenue of the Master Hounds checklist. But uh, Yeah, and, and like you said, it, we still have the flexibility with the Master Hounds checklist and, and different avenues to where if something pops up that needs to be addressed sooner than five years, yeah. uh, similar to how telemetry systems popped up or how thermal imaging devices came out of nowhere. Yeah. If we had to wait another two years yeah. on that, would that have been a good thing? Yeah. Probably not. Right. Um, so there's situations where we can uh, kind of uh, put some things together to to have some accelerated votes or what have you to implement some different things. If, yeah. If, Somebody comes out with a device where I can hold it up to a tree and it tells me whether it's a plus, minus, circle, or <laughs> then that would be good. Yeah. You know, and and I think this may be a good uh, uh, time to maybe inject this. One of the things that I see going to uh, events, and I think we're all guilty of it, and that is that Master Island's checklist, when the official is reading that, uh, so many times everybody is just talking in the clubhouse, not pay, paying zero attention to what is being said. And uh, 
that's very frustrating, especially if you're the person reading it or if there is some important items that we really need the our participants to hear. Um, we should that's something we can all work on, I think, and as participants. Stop, listen. You know, there's plenty of other time to talk and, you know, two and uh, a half minutes. Yeah, to read don't that miss thing. something that might have uh, might have helped you, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and on the other hand, make sure that uh, event officials you're reading that is it important yeah. uh, for them to hear it or else we wouldn't have you read it. It is. And, and also feel it's just disrespectful to not pay attention to when the officials are making their announcements. Right. It's not easy to get up there and talk in front of a crowd. No. You know that. Yeah. Uh, I've done it a few times now at different places. It's not easy to do it. And it makes it even harder when you're having to get louder to talk over people. And yeah. It's well, just you, uncomfortable. You and I hear it a lot. You know, with some of the major events, there's obviously more things that we go over, you know, but a lot of times, you know, We'll have situations we deal with that uh, after the fact that, you know what, we talked about this in opening ceremonies or opening remarks. We noted all this, and guess what? They weren't yeah. listening. Right. They were probably doing exactly what, is, what I'm talking about, just, you know, talking with their buddies, not paying attention, not listening, you know. And, and had they, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But it's things like that. I yeah, couldn't say it better myself. So. And the kind of we're kind of at the end of it here as far as talking about uh, procedure changes that are going in. But one thing that uh, we are going to add a section in the rule book uh, talking about full elimination style hunts. Um, we've been dealing with it's kind of a big change here. Yeah, we've we've yeah. kind of been fighting this for the past couple of years. Um, not only at the World Finals like we did this year with a, a few dead casts kind of altering how things were ran, but also you know TOC finals mm -hmm. where we have major payouts mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, there's a lot of time and money and resources invested into live shows we have going on for that kind of full uh, full elimination style event. So we're kind of making some going to make some changes to that. We're going to add a section to the rule book. Uh, solely about full elimination style events. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot to be said for a long standing. You know, UKC required plus points in order to advance. You know, and there's a lot to be said about that. A lot of good to be said about that. But the things have changed a whole lot too since the old days. You know, and there's a lot of there is these days. There's a lot more monetary prizes up. You know, things that need to be awarded. And um, if you don't have somebody to award it to simply because they didn't have uh, plus points sometimes it makes it tough the world uh, the world finals was a good example you know when we had in the semifinals when we had only five casts come back with plus points uh, we could have very easily ended the hunt on Friday night you know and we've got like you mentioned uh, a live stream thing going on on Saturday you know and everybody's banking on watching this and and it's a, the big part of the world championship and not just for the for our viewers, but also for our participants, you know, to give them that platform to to put them in that spotlight, we wouldn't have been able to give them that, you know. So we we made a, a kind of a quick change there at the World Finals. But what we're going to talk about here, uh, we said we need to fix this, and this is what we're doing to fix that. Right. So at these full elimination style events where it's elimination, we're going to start advancing dogs that don't have plus points. Um, and we're going to have a whole section dedicated to this. So maybe we'll go more in depth at it, on it at a later date. But mm -hmm. uh, like you said, um, if, if our goal ultimately as coon hunters is to mainstream coon hunting and put out these high quality live shows and, and, uh, show off these dogs and handlers on a larger scale, whether it be uh, through YouTube or, or other media outlets, uh, if not having an event because of a, a couple of dead casts is worst case scenario. That's not helping us at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so full, what we're talking about, this is only going to apply to full elimination events. And full elimination events are when you're cast and you move on to the next round and, you know, it, it, losers get eliminated and winners keep advancing. Full elimination. Full elimination is is uh, uh, like the, okay, the zones at the World Championship is an example. Uh, the Friday and Saturday night, the week before the finals, that's not full elimination. That's you have a two nights to enter. Again. That's two nights yeah. of hunting. You don't have to. That's not a full elimination event. Right. There. That's maybe you can call it what you want. But when it comes to the finals, once you get to the finals, from there it is full elimination, and that's where this is going to come into play. Right. So um, you you know so at the zones in the case of the world championship at the zones you're not going to get credit for a a cast win if you didn't have a score total score of plus points. Yeah. The, but I mean, not yeah. the finals, you will, right? Because it's now become full elimination, and that's what we're talking about. And that that doesn't just apply to the, or it won't just apply to the uh, world championship. It'll be any event that is full elimination. So technically, you could have a club that has a 
64 dog special invitation hunt or a 16 dog one where you want a four dog final or whatever you have any cast winners if it's full elimination they will advance to that final and be eligible for the next round yeah without requiring them to have plus points all right, guys, that's kind of a wrap on our uh, 2023 rule book, rule changes and procedural changes. Uh, like I, like we talked about earlier, be sure you go back to episode 22 so you can hear about the first few rule changes that we did. And obviously, uh, maybe one that you want to pay extra attention to here because there's some extra uh, extra stuff in here that are going to affect you guys in 2023. But I think it's all good stuff. and I think you guys will appreciate it. So uh, be sure you come see us at your next major event. Get your rule book. Uh, subscribe to the Coonhound Bloodlines magazine. You get one with your January issue. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to like and follow UKC Hunting Ops on Facebook and Instagram.